Hi there and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast and today I want to talk about the development of the Communist Party of Great Britain. I think it's important to talk about um, Western European Communist Parties uh, in the 1920s and 30s for a, a number of reasons. Firstly, a lot of the stuff I do focuses on uh, Stalinism and Maoism and the conditions under which obviously the Soviet Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party emerge are completely different from uh, Western Communist Parties. Secondly, not only are we um, as individuals wholly accustomed to dealing with communism in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War, but the the generation prior to this was uh, accustomed to dealing with communism in the light of the knowledge of uh, Stalinism and Stalin's crimes and the events of Prague in 1968 and Budapest in 1956. And also, Western audiences for the works of Solzhenitsyn particularly had a very different view of communism to those who would have joined the party in the 1920s and 30s. Context is everything and working class men and women. Not just working class men and women, it must be said, but mainly working class men and women who joined the party in the 1920s in the aftermath of what they perceived to be capitalism's greatest crisis, um, greatest uh, conflict, the First World War, and during the beginnings of the various uh, economic uh, downturns and crises of the 1920s, and then the hungry 30s, uh, communism made a perfect sense. The knowledge that Stalinism and the Soviet Union under Stalin appeared to be economically transforming itself and that much of uh, what Marx and Lenin had predicted appeared to be coming true. Um, uh, This obviously is a very selective take on communism presented uh, the adherence uh, to communism with a very compelling world vision After 1933, as David Cote points out in his book The Fellow Travellers, communism also, and the Soviet Union also, represented something else, not just of an alternate economic model, but also the last chance and the last best hope to do something about fascism. And the relationship between communism and fascism in the 1930s is that one that seems to come to define the struggles between right and left throughout the 20th century. Communism claims for itself the mantle of anti-fascism, which is why Stalin's agreement with Hitler in August 1939, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, is so shocking to so many of the non-communist fellow travellers and also to um, Western communists in general. So I'm looking at Francis Beckett's book, uh, The Enemy Within. Francis Beckett's a very interesting guy. His father, John Beckett, was one of Mosley's black shirts. And he, a lot of his writing is uh, focused on the, the kind of the sectarianism of uh, British uh, political life and the strange subcultures that exist at the margins of British politics. And the Communist Party, for its members, wasn't simply just a political organisation, but really a a way of life. Um, If you read David Aronovich's um, biography of growing up in a a Communist Party household, and the various things that Alexei Sales had to say on the subject, it is a, a, it was an all-encompassing way of life, rather kind of well, like a cult in in many aspects. The inaugural meeting of the Communist Party of Great Britain happened in 1920 on 31st of July. 160 socialists uh, met at the Cannon Street Hotel, uh, which was a railway hotel near St Paul's Cathedral. And they had arrived uh, together from a variety of smaller uh, socialist groups um, that had emerged over the previous 20 to 30 years. Um, And they had uh, agreed that they would merge into the Communist Party. The chairman, Arthur McManus, um, had been one of the Red Clydesiders. Um, Red Clydeside in 1919 in Glasgow was 
evidence of the polarisation of politics in certain urban uh, constituencies in Great Britain, the uh, wave of socialist radicalism in Glasgow saw workers go on a 40-hour strike and 100,000 working-class protesters fill uh, George Square and raise the red flag over the square. It was so alarming to the government that they uh, moved troops and tanks into Glasgow. And the uh, fear that the uh, government had was that um, in the immediate aftermath of the Russian Revolution that these ideas were indeed catching. Britain was fighting an anti-communist, anti-Bolshevist campaign in Russia alongside America, France and Japan um, in 1919 and there was um, an alarmist fear in the air. Probably there was no threat of revolution whatsoever. Um, There's a very interesting quote by Arthur Balfour in, um, it was quoted in Adam Tooze's brilliant book, uh, The Deluge, that uh, some post-war social reform was no price to pay in order to stave off a revolution. And that shows that the government were well aware of the level of tensions uh, in society. The fact that there had been um, a workers' revolution in Russia, or at least for our purposes, the fact that a party had seized power uh, notionally on behalf of the working classes, uh, meant that there was a, a great deal of excitement uh, across the left in Europe, a sense that anything was possible. And it's that sense of possibility that the government found most alarming. And the intervention in uh, Russia that had begun with a small number of troops seemed to be on the verge of escalating into a, a major war, a kind of mass mobilisation that Britain had recently ended uh, against Germany in the trenches of France and Belgium. Francis Beckett writes, Above all, they, the uh, working classes, would not go to war against the Russian Bolsheviks, and it looked very much as though the government was going to try to make them do just that. Any attempt to force war, the communists believe, uh, could trigger a revolution. Newspapers were campaigning for troops to be sent to support Poland against Russia, a war which Russia was winning. Three days before the Unity Conference, the Secretary of State for War, Winston Churchill, published an article in the Evening News suggesting that Britain should arm Germany so that Germany could fight Russia. The rhetoric was vintage Churchill. Reading it, you can almost hear his voice. Eastward of Poland lies the huge mass of Russia, not a wounded Russia only, but a poisoned Russia, an infected Russia, a plague-bearing Russia, a Russia of armed hordes smiting not only with bayonet and cannon, but accompanied and preceded by swarms of typhus-bearing vermin which destroy the bodies of men and political doctrines which destroy the health and even the soul of nations. That's the Churchill quote. The defence of the Soviet Union was clearly to be the party's first task. It was largely for this that Lenin put so much time and money into bringing together the warring socialist groups in one united communist party. To do it, he had to knock a great many British heads together and to take quick decisions on the hoof about whom to include and whom to leave out. So here we have it. The origins of the Communist Party of Great Britain really are Bolshevik. Lenin knew that unless there were robust communist parties in democratic countries across Europe, then he would be unable to do anything to influence the foreign policies of those nations. A large and powerful communist party in Great Britain, for example, would be able to mobilise working class support to go on strike if there was any uh, suggestion of an attack on uh, Russia. Lenin had a keen understanding of the complexities of British socialist politics. Um, He made sure that the British Socialist Party, um, which had been affiliated to the Labour Party, um, and the Socialist Labour Party were included. The uh, Socialist Labour Party, it must be noted, was not affiliated to the official Labour Party, which throughout the 20s and 30s uh, did its very best to avoid any kind of political radicalism whatsoever. One of the great misunderstandings about the Labour Party 
throughout much of the 20th century is the uh, belief um, normally propagated by Times editorial writers that the Labour Party has particularly been on the radical left. It is not really. Um, it has constantly expelled members for having associations or affiliations with the Communist Party, the Independent Labour Party, uh, the National Unemployed uh, Workers Movement, uh, and um, anything that smacked of revolutionary politics. And for their part, um, revolutionary groups on the left saw the British Labour Party as being reformist, i.e. they are trying to um, make the best of capitalism and uh, in their own way actually try to rescue it, to try to humanise it a little bit and make sure that the working classes have enough of the benefits of the capitalist system to keep them quiet. Into this was added the Workers' Socialist Federation, who were run by Sylvia Pankhurst, uh, daughter of Emmeline, um, and then smaller groups from across the country, particularly places like the north of England and South Wales, um, emerged um, and became part of the incorporated uh, Communist Party. These parties, these little groups, had been uh, highly active during the First World War. They had uh, gone on strike, um, endured lockouts and often um, police uh, brutality, um, in order to make sure not only that um, the war came to an, an end, obviously their efforts had no bearing on it whatsoever, but also to make sure that the position of um, workers uh, was maintained. There was a strong suspicion of this practice of dilution, where um, the, work, the rights of workers who'd gone away to fight would not be anywhere near as good when they came back at the end of the war. And of course the key event that they had been in involved in was the campaign to prevent an intervention against the Russian Revolution. Um, in November 1917, um, the Hands Off Russia campaign was launched um, and Lenin channelled about £55,000, which should be the equivalent of a million pounds today, to help get the Communist Party off the ground, uh, making sure that there was a political wing to his struggle um, in Great Britain was very, very important. And there were uh, rep uh, equivalent versions of this action in um, France and other Western European countries. So one can only imagine what this did for the egos of the disparate um, squabbling sectarian um, communist groups who um, often uh, kind of remind me of the Monty Python People's Front of Judea sort of sketch. Um, they had existed in uh, largely in obscurity uh, throughout the war years and beforehand. And now the leadership of the one of the world well, the world's largest state, had uh, expressed an interest in them and their efforts and was willing to uh, put down serious money in order to assist. Lenin was advised by uh, British socialists who would write him lengthy position papers on the nature of the British left and the nature of British politics. Um, it seemed odd that Lenin gave the time to all of this that he did, given the other situations in Russia that he had to deal with. However, um, one of the decisions that was taken was to exclude the Independent Labour Party, which should not be uh, confused with the Labour Party that emerged from the Labour Representation Committee uh, of 1900. The ILP was established seven years before this and was significantly to the left. However, not far enough to the left for uh, many of the new members of the British Communist Party's uh, tastes. Um, it was seen as being too reformist and um, too likely to uh, support a kind of a reformed and tamed capitalism 
um, this is not how the Labour Party saw it. Uh, the Labour Party looked upon the ILP uh, as a kind of apostates and um, viewed them as uh, dangerous radicals far too close to the Communist Party. The irony for the Communists is that the ILP was the biggest party on the left with 35,000 members. And had it been incorporated in the Communist Party of Great Britain, the, the uh, Communist Party would have been a serious political force to be reckoned with. One which uh, perhaps may never have achieved power, but certainly would have uh, redrawn the map of British politics in the interwar years and perhaps even beyond. Instead of pursuing its revolutionary goals, the Communist Party of Great Britain would now spend years bickering and fighting with the ILP uh, to the mutual harm of both organisations. One of the great ironies for the Communist Party, of course, was that Lenin uh, was a far cannier operator than they had previously imagined. He suggested, in fact, he insisted that the Communist Party try to seek Labour Party affiliation. Lenin was uh, utterly dismissive and contemptuous of social democratic parties, um, particularly as it had been so many of them had supported um, the First World War. Um, however, he looked at the Labour Party and saw that uh, there was very little that could happen without it, as it clearly had the support of the majority of Britain's working class and was the kind of the authentic party of the British working class. The pilgrimage for British communists was um, to be invited to Moscow. One very interesting book on the subject is the uh, autobiography My Generation by Will Painter. Will Painter from my hometown here, Cardiff, um, had been a, a miner by the age of 14 and when he joined the Communist Party he quickly emerged as a skilled orator and somebody who had uh, immense talent. He visited the uh, Lenin School in Moscow where he uh, trained as a political commissar and was trained in various aspects of uh, espionage and worked as a courier across Europe in the 1930s, taking uh, messages from Moscow to the uh, Communist Party in Germany. And later he emerged in the Spanish Civil War as a commissar. Francis Beckett gives us an illuminating account of what the journey to Moscow entailed. He writes about Jim Murphy of the Communist Party and says, Murphy, like many British communists, visited Moscow before the Unity Conference. Getting there in those days was dangerous, illegal, lengthy and uncomfortable. Through the Soviet, though the Soviet Union paid the bills, the journey involved many days on the freezing seas between Norway and Russia, but it was the best and most exciting thing that had happened to this clever young Scotsman. He later described how the Russian communists tutored their foreign protégés. There were commissions for each country, including a British commission, which talked for as long as necessary. The Russians seemed incapable of exhaustion by discussion. We had got to learn that a communist party was the general staff of a class war, uh, class marching to civil war. Uh, that it had to be disciplined, a party organised on military lines, ready for every emergency, an election, a strike, an insurrection. The Russians, having successfully organised their own revolution, believed they could teach everyone else how to organise theirs. British communists grew to believe it too, and it was an illusion which was to cause them much misery in the next seven decades. The idea that a revolution that had occurred in Russia under very, very specific historical conditions could be replicated in peacetime Western countries was really a, a kind of a profound misunderstanding of the course of the Russian Revolution itself. Not only during the February Revolution with the Bolsheviks, um, the majority of the leadership not in Russia, but by the uh, October Revolution um, in the weeks beforehand, 
the party was barely capable of um, uh, pulling together, pulling itself together to decide on the date of the revolution um, or to work constructively with other revolutionary parties. The reality is in both February and October 1917, instead of the power being seized, power was simply allowed to slip through the fingers of those who wielded it the, the, uh, the, um, the say two states, essentially a czarist one and a provisional government one, ceased to function. And so uh, the uh, hope that there would be a revolution in Britain was dashed time and time again, largely for this reason. There's an interesting postscript to um, Jim Murphy's story, and it reads like this. In Moscow, uh, Murphy was arrested on suspicion of being a police spy. The common turn round an inquiry and decided he was not guilty. He was much relieved because, as he wrote later, the Russians have a method of dealing with police spies which does not leave any room for continued activity. The allegation surfaced again in 1928, and again as a dark rumour after he left the Communist Party in the 1930s. He returned to Britain, broken out, out of work, and on Victoria Station he ran into a man he'd known in Moscow, Mikhail Borodin, who, had, who was working in England as the Comintern's agent under the name George Brown. Like most Comintern agents, he had several identities. Borodin was no more his real name than Brown. He was born Mikhail Grunsberg in 1884 in Russia um, and joined the Jewish Socialist Party as a student. He was imprisoned in Tsarist Russia and then trained as a lawyer in America. Borodin gave Murphy a job as his secretary, and together they guided the new party through the first months of its life. On that day in 1920, as at the Unity Conference, as communists um, of the newly incorporated Communist Party um, uh, listened to speakers and delegates, the belief that revolution was just months away um, was uh, very clear in the minds of most. And again, you need to think of the historical context. Britain had enjoyed a very, very brief post-war boom and then a hugely deep um, post-war economic slump. Uh, if you go back, I don't know how many months, but I did a thing on the forgotten depression um, at the, uh, in the early 1920s. And this was just uh, really uh, kicking off at the time of the conference. And also, there's still the uh, aftermath of the First World War to consider. So it was understandable that people believed themselves to be in revolutionary times, and there had been not only a revolution in Russia, but also attempted revolutions in Bavaria, in Hungary, and in other parts of Europe. So um, this was not just wishful thinking. I think uh, for us to see this as fanciful says perhaps more about people um, in the post-Cold War world and the 21st century than it does about the conditions at the time. Tony Judd in his book, uh, uh, book of Essays, Reappraisals, talks about the forgotten 20th century. Um, this is a, a little snapshot of uh, an ideological moment, um, a world seen far removed from us, but really less than a hundred years ago. Um, and in that moment are people that have ideas which seem um, largely, um, largely fanciful, and yet for them were based in real-world conditions and considerations that made the prospect of a revolution in Great Britain seem abundantly, abundantly close. The first debate on the agenda that day was the question as to whether um, the party would support armed revolution. And this notion was uh, instantly dismissed as being uh, ludicrous and fanciful and unworkable um, and likely to lead to uh, imminent disaster. The next question on the agenda was whether the party would contest elections or not. Many groups on the left uh, refuse to contest elections because they argue that this is simply an endorsement and engagement with the uh, political systems of bourgeois capitalism. 
However, the Communist Party decided that it would contest elections and also that eventually it would seek affiliation to the Labour Party. Even though this was a subject of heated debate, so Lenin's views uh, eventually prevailed. OK, well, I'm going to finish there. Um, I want to look a bit more into the British Communist Party in the not-too-distant future and perhaps look at the um, Communist Party of the USA as well because these um, small fringe political organisations in some ways actually tell us an interesting sub-narrative to our times. Anyway, uh, I hope you found that useful. Do give us um, a hello at the Facebook page, Explaining History Facebook page, um, lots of great conversations going on there at the moment and also uh, do try to give us a good thumbs up on iTunes if you can. Thanks very much, bye bye.